I've been, uh, you can open up to Ephesians 1. Of course, I've been studying like a madman every time I have a chance on the, the subject of power, knowing what the Lord spoke last year during the conference. And uh, this is the year of power. And so I've been studying everything I can on it. Uh, I'm finding out, I thought I knew quite a bit about it. <laughs> I'm finding out there's quite a bit more that I, that I didn't know. But when it comes to uh, power, one of the most powerful <laughs> passages on it is in Ephesians chapter 1. And I know we spent like a year almost on Ephesians, but let's look at it again, okay? And it's in that, uh, that prayer that Paul prays for the church. So Ephesians chapter 1, <clears throat> now the verse I'm after, the main one, is verse 19. But I just can't, I just can't do it anymore, you know. You, I just have to start where this passage starts. So let's start in verse 14. Oh, excuse me, verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Can I? <clears throat> the eyes of your understanding. <clears throat> understanding is in the mind. Isn't that right? What if we said it like this, so that your mind can see? <laughs> I'm, I'm, going to, I'm doing, a, doing my best tonight to convey to you a, an image. I hardly ever do this, you know, because I, I don't believe in delivering uh, normally a revelation. I use the term until the bread is done. This one's still partially in the oven. <laughs> But I want to try to convey to you a, a, an image that I keep seeing in this passage that's helping me understand better the greatness of this power. And I believe it will you too. So let, let's pray. Say, Father, Father, help me by your spirit deliver in words what you're showing me in pictures. And Father, if possible, make it even simpler so that not only I can understand it, but everybody can understand it. Help our mind see what it is you're trying to get across to us so that we can demonstrate the risen Christ to a lost world. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Everybody says, Amen. So he's praying that our mind can see, that the eyes of our understanding be enlightened. And then he starts mentioning things that he wants us to know that you may know what is the hope of his calling. I think so many people, because of the way the world has beaten them down, and they have a poor self-image, and maybe a history of failures. Now, just so you'll know, I don't care what you're thinking, everybody has a history of failures. <laughs> a lot of people don't show it, a lot of people aren't very transparent, um, but everybody, I don't know of anybody that doesn't have a history of failures. That's why I'm constantly saying, get over yourself. We, you know, qu quit looking at that guy like he's such a hot shot. No, he's got a history of failures too. We're all, we're all born dead, and we're all made alive by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. He's restoring all of us. And there's a hope for you. God didn't just save you to, for somebody to babysit you into heaven. He has got a hope for you. There is a calling. There is a, now it may not be, uh, you know, we instantly think because we're programmed by the world, we think massive ministry and great outreach and touching continents and all of that. I loved how Alan said it the other day. I thought this was so pure. You know, his calling for you, there might be one guy, your, your pure calling from God might be to spend 30 years getting that one guy saved. 
because nobody else will put up with him. Nobody else will love him. Nobody else will take the abuse. Nobody else will, will do what's required. But he says, I know I found you. I found you. And if you'll listen to me, you and I together, we'll get that guy saved. And that's going to take 30 years. But if, you, if, you and I, if, we, if you'll stay with me and we accomplish this, you have fulfilled your calling. And your reward will be the same as if you won an entire continent, if that was that guy's calling. But there is a hope of calling for you. Uh, I don't mention names. Uh, a, a hero of mine, a real hero to me that never gets any glory, uh, is a, a lady who runs an orphanage in a, uh, another country. It's, it's, uh, it's, got its, it's got its rewards. I mean, these children that they, they rescue from terrible, terrible situations. Every one of them winds up getting born again. Every one of them becomes a strong Christian, and they adopt them into good, solid families, you know. But, boy, it is work. And the devil fights every inch of the way, and there's no worldwide fame, and you're not on TV, and you're not driving Bentleys, and, well, I don't know what you drive. You know, you know what I mean. It's, it's not riches and fame and fortune. But, you know, my Bible says pure religion and undefiled. You know, you start taking care of the widows and the orphans. Man, <laughs> talk about a high reward. Hope of a calling, see. And I'll tell you this. When, when you find the hope of your calling, you were born for that. It, it may be something in the natural. You thought, oh, I'd never want to do that. But you find out. You let him lead you into the hope of your calling. You, you'll, never, you'll never be so satisfied. And I don't care if the devil throws cinder blocks your way every five minutes and all hell comes against you. You wouldn't trade it for anything. Because he called you there. I was reading again about Paul and, uh, today and the stonings and the, 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 the beatings and the they drove him out of town. They were going to kill him. He had to leave town. Let him down in a basket and all. Just the man's life for decades after he started serving the Lord was just full of, of persecution and revilings and, and arguings and stonings. And, and, and yet he says this light affliction. <laughs> this light affliction which is but for a moment. How, what do you mean a moment, Paul? It's like 30, 40 years. <laughs> but see, compare, he's thinking about eternity, see. He said that this light affliction, which is just for a moment. He said, that first instant that you step over into glory. And you get a glimpse of your reward for all eternity. And let's just not say it that way. You just get a glimpse of eternity. Being with him. He said, it's... This light affliction, these stonings and things, it's, it's nothing. It's not even to be compared. There is a hope of a calling for you. Don't you wish there was a church where you could be taught how to find it? And you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't have to try and figure it out. That there is somebody sent from heaven, and I mean somebody, not something, he, the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven that his job is just to take you by the hand so you're no longer an orphan. He'll say, come on, honey, come on. I, I know everything you're asking. I know everything that you're, you're, you, I know you're calling. I know how to get into it. I know how, to, I, and by the way, when you get there, I'll empower you to do it. Put your hand in mine. Come on. Don't, aren't you glad there's a church? Thank God for Pastor Dave. That just gently, year after year after year, would teach us. Thank God for pastor. So the hope of your calling, he says, that's the first thing Paul wants you to know. The hope of your calling. But look at the second thing. He says, I want your mind to, to see. I want your, the eyes of your understanding to see this. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. 
I was looking, doing some word definitions, and uh, there was a little comment, a little note there, and it says, the way Paul is wording the, the words, the Greek words that he chose here, it's almost like he is straining at the language, trying to put in words how great the riches of what we really have truly is. It's like, look at it, the riches. And you look that word up, it's exceeding wealth. It's wealth beyond counting. It's, it's the highest words in the Greek language. You couldn't be any richer. <laughs> what, are, what is it, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. We have a vast inheritance. You know what? That old song, just give me a little cabin over in the corner of glory. That doesn't match what Paul's saying here. <laughs> he says, we have this vast inheritance. And I want you to know about it. I want the eyes of your understanding See, the devil wants you to think that you're supposed to, what is that, how does that one preacher say it? You're just supposed to live on Grumble Alley. <laughs> you know, I am nothing, I have nothing, I can do nothing. <laughs> and I'm not talking about material wealth so much. I'm talking about all the resources of heaven that are available to us. Man, a man on the phone the other day, he and I was talking about... Uh, the kingdom of God, you know, and uh, it's hard to describe really. You know, Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you and many things he said about it. But I said, you know, this kingdom of God, it, it's, a re it's a real thing. In my mind, I, I'm thinking of the prophet that time when the Assyrians came out against, uh, oh, what was that guy's name? Now, the, his, ser his servant, I, didn't, I don't have any notes tonight. But there was the prophet and his servant. And all these Assyrians, thousands upon thousands, came out against him. You remember that? And of course the servant, he's like, oh my goodness. And he goes in and he tells the prophet, you know, basically, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die. Look at all these Assyrians. Look at all these warriors that have come against us. And the prophet, you know, he's, he, he's just not getting excited at all. He's just sitting there. Sipping his coffee and having another Krispy Kreme donut, you know. And he's going, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. Doesn't that kind of go along with what we're looking at here? Just open his eyes that he can see. And suddenly, the Lord answered that prayer. And the servant saw on the mountaintops all of these chariots of God with angels, warring angels. And the prophet said, there be more with us than be with them. Now that's, see, that's the kingdom of God. It's a real thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's real and it's, it's not far off. It's not in heaven. It's almost like, I hate to use the word dimension, but that's not far off. It's you know, in him we live and move and have our being. He is, if you could see me, I'm holding my right hand right close to my face. He is right here. <laughs> He is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. And we have access. All those chariots and all those angels, you think they do, you don't have access to those? What are the riches of the glory of this inheritance that he's given us? Hmm. Now here's the verse I'm after. The next one, verse 19. Paul wants the eyes of our understanding. He wants our mind to be able to see this. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? Now that word power, that's the Greek word dunamis. That's where we get our word dynamite. What is the ex now Here he goes again. He's straining. Look at, look at these words. He is... He is He's straining, trying to use the most descriptive words he can. Exceeding greatness 
of his power just to Pastor Dave. <laughs> Is that what it says? To usward who believe. Now that word, I think if there is such a thing as power, and I think there is, and if it's dynamite power, I think God has more of it than anybody else. Would that be, is that like God 101? Is that okay? I don't think anybody has any more power than God. Do you? And he's going, our mind, Paul is praying, prayer center, get a clue. I'm praying that your understanding, the eyes of your understanding be open. That your mind can see what is the exceeding, exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe. Well, what, what, what could we compare that power to? He starts to tell you. It's according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above everyone say far, far above. Say, say not just above, not just above. far above far. all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all Verse 22 says he's put all things under his feet. But he gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Let me ask you, where are the feet? Are they not on the body? So if, if all things are under his feet and the feet are under the body, doesn't all things have to be under the body? Yeah, but I'm the little toe. He's still under you. The enemy's still under you. That's why, it's one of the reasons he said, born of woman, there's not a risen a greater than John the Baptist. I mean, he, that's, pretty, that's pretty high <laughs> commendation, you know. We're talking Moses, Noah, <laughs> all these, Abraham. But he says, there's not a risen a greater than John the Baptist, but the least, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John because the devil's under your feet let's back up a little bit now I, I haven't tried to con yes sir okay before I start giving you the image the picture he's notice here how he's comparing this power that he wants us to know about he said well it's according to that power that God exercised when he raised Christ from the dead and the reason he's doing that, look at the first verse of the next chapter. And you hath he quickened who were dead. You were dead. We were all dead in trespasses and sins. So the reason he's comparing that is this. So I've been meditating and praying this for years, as you, as you guys know. But here recently, every now and then, this, this image begins to form in me again. We all know Christ died on the cross. He gave up the spirit. And, and he, he died. And his body was even placed. It took down off the cross and placed in a tomb. So I've been thinking about a corpse. I mean, we don't like to think about his body being a corpse. Laying there in a, in a, in a tomb. But there it is. So let's just think of any corpse. You know, the world is very busy. Have you noticed that? Uh, you go downtown Tulsa and any time, or especially like lunchtime, and I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on. There's buses and taxis and people walking and going to lunch and talking and sitting out. And I mean, the world is a busy, busy place. All kinds of activities. But if you laid a corpse right there on the sidewalk. Now, bear with me. This, 
first off, people would call the cops. But <laughs> I'm trying to illustrate, the, if there's a corpse laying there, all this activity is going on. What does it mean to the corpse? Nothing at all. I mean, there may be, within earshot, there may be a, a, a little cafe and a young man with his sweetie pie. And he's been dating her for a while. That's the very day that he's, he's opened up the little, he gets down on one knee and he opens up the little box and, he, you know, he, I love you, I love you, would you be my wife? And this tender moment of love being expressed, what does it mean to the corpse? What, what involvement does he have with that? He doesn't know anything about it at all, does he? There might be another table or a conversation going on and maybe these are two high-powered executives and they're talking about building the the newest building in Tulsa and it's going to be so many stories tall and it's going to eclipse anything else and they're talking about massive economic change to the, the structure of the city. I mean, in other words, there's, there's busy things going on, important things, but that corpse is dead to the world and nothing good or indifferent. What if, what if there's a robbery taking place? A robbery taking place, you know, and, and can the corpse do anything about that? He's dead to the world. Isn't that right? God's saying we're dead to the kingdom before we get born again. There are angels. There is holiness. There is righteousness. There is plans of God. There is the Holy Spirit. There is a whole realm of the kingdom of God that before you get born again, you're just as dead as a doornail. You're as much a corpse to the kingdom as that corpse on the sidewalk is to the world. You're dead. Later on in that same chapter, he says, before you were enlightened, before you were born again, he says you were without hope and without God in the world. Now what's interesting, that letter is written to the Ephesians. If you remember in the book of Acts one time, after Paul had been there teaching for quite a while, there was a great stir amongst the people. And they gathered into a coliseum or a theater that they had there. And for the space of two hours, the Ephesians, they cried, two hours, they chanted over and over, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Diana was this god, goddess, uh, that they worshipped there. The temple at Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the world. It took over 200 years to finish building that temple. People came from everywhere to see it. And it wasn't just the Ephesians that worshipped there. All of Asia Minor worshipped. If you, if you just read up on it, it's, it's amazing. And if anybody was sincere, you know, there's these people today that say, it doesn't matter whether you choose Christ or not. Just as long as you're sincere, you'll be okay. Well, would you say those people were sincere? I mean, for, uh, two hours. I mean, it's not un unusual to see people in a stadium shout for, the, for their favorite football team for two hours. But to sit there for two hours and say over and over again, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great. These are serious people. And to those people, this letter of the, to the Ephesians, the same people, Paul says, before, before you believed, you were without Christ, without hope, and without God in the world. There is only one Savior. He is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by Him. All right, getting back to our vision now. See, so you got that corpse, how it is dead to the world? Well, let's go back to Jesus now in the tomb. Now, I'm not going to get into exactly where Jesus was, His spirit. We do know that He had already told Him. He said, as Noah was in the belly of the whale, so must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. You remember that? So we know His spirit was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Now think about this. A corpse, a dead person, what power do they have of their own to come back to life? Abs can they save themselves? Can they regenerate themselves? Would you say they're absolutely powerless? Can't even really pray, I mean. <laughs> Not the way we think of it. You know, lips won't move, nothing, you know. You talk about total dependence. 
Yet Christ trusted the Father based on the word that had been spoken by the prophet. Thou will not leave thy holy one in hell, neither shall my will not leave my soul in hell, neither shall thy holy one see corruption. Trusted. And sure enough, when the price had been paid, you talk about grace. This is why I keep saying by grace. What can a dead man do to save himself? What can a dead man do to raise again? It's all based on the power of God. It's all based, it's all by grace. But by grace through faith. And he, what he's telling us, that same power, according to the power that God used to raise Christ from the dead, you had no power to save yourself. You were as dead as Christ. You were as dead to everything of God. When it, it's not that you couldn't read his word or things like Old Testament people. But when it comes to the things of the kingdom. You are as dead to the things of the kingdom of God. As that corpse is to the world laying on the sidewalk. I keep seeing that image. Yet when, he, when you heard the gospel and believed. Not some less power. That same regenerative power that raised Christ from the dead. Came in you and created a new spirit on the inside of you. And he quickened us to new life. I'm getting better. <laughs> Next time I tell it, it'll be better yet. <laughs> getting better. But he's, if Paul was straining, I'm straining, trying to get us to understand this power. But he didn't just raise us to be the same old creature we were before. We're raised to a whole new world. We're raised to new life. Because in that, same, that next chapter, he, he says the same thing. It's really a continuation of the same thing he said in verse 19 and, and 20. When he's talking about raising Christ from the dead and seating him at his own right hand and far above all principality and power. He says plainly in chapter 2, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, um, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. In the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. See, now you've got a new nature. You're children of God. Before, you, were, you had a nature, the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened, that means made alive, quickened us together with Christ. That, that, now I understand better. By grace are you saved. What can a dead man do? You couldn't save yourself. You couldn't do good works. To had, Can a corpse do good works to live again? <laughs> can a corpse give money to live again? It's by grace. God does it or it doesn't get done. It's by grace. You can't, you can't join a church and do it. You can't. It's by grace. By grace are you saved. And hath raised us up together. Now that word together, everywhere you see together here. Years ago, Jim Martin one day called me. He just, no, Jim's, Dr. Jim Martin, excuse me, Dr. Jim Martin. He, he called me so excited like a little kid that, that had just found a new toy or something. He said, Gary, I was studying this passage in Ephesians and I was going through the Greek definitions. He says, do you know what that really says there, that, that word in the Greek? And I said, no, tell me. He says, when it says, he said, we have this mindset that God raised up his son Jesus from the dead. And then 2,000 years later when Gary heard the gospel or Jim heard the gospel, that at that point, 2,000 years later, then he raised, a, raised Jim from the dead or raised Gary from the dead. But he said, that is not what that verse says. He says, from God's point of view, when he raised Christ from the dead at that same instant, he rose Gary from the dead. <laughs> I'm going, what? See, because we're finite creatures. We have a hard time thinking about time. <laughs> It's hard for us to understand a, a being and our universe, or, or you know, that's not a, a realm that exists without time. But that's where God is. 
And from his point of view, it wasn't 2,000 years later. When he raised Christ from the dead, at that same instant, he saw Gary Carpenter walk out of the grave right in him. And the only way I can better understand that now, this is years later, finally it dawned on my lightning quick mind. <laughs> Adam and Eve. Eve is called the mother of all living. Is that not right? And it dawned on me one day. All the generations of humans, all of them, down through the centuries, were in the loins of Adam and Eve. Christ is the last Adam. And when he raised him from the dead, if you'll allow me, spiritually, every believer that ever will be was in the spiritual loins of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I know. I know, right? We were in him. See, and that's really... For years I misquoted this, uh, this next part here. It says, it says, has raised us up together. And I used to say, and made us sit together in heavenly places. And I, I used to say, with Christ Jesus. That's not what it says. We're made to sit together in Christ Jesus. I was already, now see, here we go again. My brain starts leaking out my left ear here. But what the Greek actually says, Gary Carpenter was already in Christ because God knows everything <laughs> I was already in Christ the moment he was risen from the dead God somehow looks down through the t time that doesn't even exist to him and he saw me in Christ I am seated there in him with all authority whatever I'm in him how could I have less authority I'm in him not with him. That's right. I'm in him. I'm still trying. Paul says, over in the Philippians, he says, I want to be found in him. You remember that? Someday I'll know exactly what that means. I'm, <laughs> I'm knowing a little better now than I used to. But. And has raised us up together. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come. You know, a week or so ago we did a, a teaching called Faith That Changes the World. And that word, word world there in Hebrews 11 is not the word cosmos. It's the word eon. Talking about the ages. God did all of this so that in all of the ages to come, I'm thinking this world and the next, he might, here we go again, might show the tiny little bit of riches. Here Paul goes again, the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Mm. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Boy, ever since I've been seeing that corpse coming back to life, I'm understanding better, even more better. Is that cocaine more better? <laughs> Lily talks to me a lot, you know, it makes sense, more better. I'm understanding better, even, even when I thought I fully understood it. Corpse can't raise itself. Corpse can't do good works to come back to life. Corpse can't give money to raise itself. There's nothing a corpse can do except yield to God. God does it all. That power, let's back up again to our verse 19 now. Because this is the year of power. I'm praying for all of us, and not just here at this church, but everybody that's attached to this vision. This has to happen. That the eyes of our understanding and I, I like the I like that where my mind can see like that Gehazi thank God I finally thought of that servant's name Gehazi it was Gehazi and he was all worried you know all worried there's all these Assyrians that are going to kill us and the prophet says there be more with us and be with them and he goes and looks out the window and there's thousands upon thousands of enemy and he counts one two, <laughs> one, two. what do you mean there's more that be with us and be with them and he Lord, open his eyes that he might see. 
Paul is praying that same kind of thing for us. And I'm praying it for us now. I'm praying it for me and for you and for all of us that are pressing into revival. We have got to see. Our mind has to see the exceeding, verse 19 again of chapter 1, the exceeding greatness of his dynamite to usward who believe. We've got to see it like Gehazi saw the chariots and the angels. We've got to see it like that. When we walk into a room, and I don't care if it's an insane asylum, I don't care if it's a cancer ward, I don't care if devils are so thick, it's like you're moving through liquid butter. <laughs> when you walk in the room, all of God's dynamite power walks in with you. You're not the one intimidated. The devils are the one intimidating. Have you come to torment us before the time? Yes. <laughs> Come out! <laughs> Jesus' name. <laughs> Go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Chapter 2. We're coming into a serious, serious time. Uh, not only in our nation, but worldwide, I believe. We've got a Muslim world to win. We've got a Hindu world to win. God loves the Muslims. Have you all read anything about how God's appearing, Jesus is appearing in dreams to Muslims? Did you know they're the Arabs, the, for, for the most part, the Muslims, the Arabs at least, you, you do understand that they're the, the, they're the children of Abraham. Through his son with uh, uh, Ishmael. Yeah, through Ishmael. And God is appearing to them. Jesus is showing up and talking to them in dreams, and they're getting a lot of them are getting saved. Well, I call that a demonstration of power myself. That's why I got Paul saved. He's an Arab, if you'll allow me, and not a, a Ishmael. Don't get me wrong. I mean, he's Middle Eastern. God had to appear to him. He couldn't be persuaded. Jesus had to show up. Well, we need the power to show up. See, because what he told them here, when he came to Corinth, you've got to understand that, you know, we just look at these, we, the Corinthians, well, okay, it's, so it's such and such a book in my Bible. Corinth was a pagan, pagan, pagan city in Greece. It was, um, I don't even want to go into all of that, but it, I mean, they, if, if you read some of the history about Corinth and the type of uh, promiscuous temple worship that they had, I mean, here, and here you're going to come and you're going to preach Jesus <laughs> to these people. And he, he, he already knows a word debate is not going to get it done. See, I've preached in the prisons enough. I have dealt with enough Mis Muslims. <laughs> oh, help me, Lord. I have dealt with enough Muslims in prison. They know their Koran, and I know my Bible, and pretty, you know, pretty soon you've got a shout and match going back and forth, and, and nobody gets converted, and everybody's more entrenched than they were before you started. You know? You're not going to win these people with a word debate. Paul knew he wasn't going to win the Corinthians with a word debate either. So here's what he says. And I, brethren, when I came to you, and he's talking about when he first came to them, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, Declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you. Save Jesus Christ. And him crucified. Now that is the message to the lost. I don't care whether you're agnostic, atheist, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, whatever. There's no point trying to teach them the deeper things of God. Because he plainly says further down here. Until they're born again. They can't know the things of God. They have to have a new spirit on the inside of them to be taught. There's only one message, and that's Christ and him crucified. But how you teach that message, because watch this. 
He says, so I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. In other words, it wasn't my physical presence that impressed you. I'm just me. I'm just with you. I, don't, I can't tell you how often I feel like that even on a Wednesday night. But I'm, I mean, I'm sitting here amongst people that's been sitting under the best teaching for many years. And, you know, and I'm supposed to come teach you. See? And I come and, you know, in my, in my mind, I'm, I mean, I'm trying to come up here and act like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but on the inside, there's a lot of weakness and fear and trembling, you know. I mean, I, who am I? See? And Paul's going, I didn't come to impress you with my physical attributes or my great oratory, as Dave would say. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but here it is. But in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Now there it is. That's your word dynamite again. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The world needs to see something. They need to see the power of God. And I know that I know that same, I could take that same Muslim guy in, in prison. I'm thinking of one guy in the I just really like that guy. I think he liked me, but boy, we had some real good arguments <laughs> about the Koran and the Bible, you know. And, but that same guy, I, I don't know if this is the case, now we're talking many years ago, but that same guy, if he had a blind child, if he had, let's just say for, you know, if he had a blind child, and he, does he love his child? Of course. And, you know, if everybody he knew growing up, you know, that, that little Muslim child in the mosque, and prayers had been prayed, and his, that child stayed blind, okay, that's one thing. But then, they say, well, do you mind if I pray in the name of Jesus? And if somebody prays in the name of Jesus, and the power of God manifests. And that little blind child, her, her eyes are opened and she can see. That same old boy that argued with me so strong, he says, I can just see him going, tell me more about your Jesus. I need to know about this Jesus. See, that's what the world has got to have. We've got to have this demonstration of spirit. Demonstration of the power of God. So all I can tell you is tonight, what's going through me, let's go back to Ephesians. I should have told you to keep your place. If you want to pray some, if you want to join me, I, I, am, I am praying this several times a day, just, just like it's written. Just like it's written here. For myself, for the prayer center, for everybody that's attached with the prayer center, that this very thing is what we need right here. We need the, the answer, the manifestation of this prayer. So do you care if we pray it together? Would that be okay? Say, Lord, we pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God. The eyes of our understanding being enlightened that we may know what is the hope of your calling and what the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of your power to us who believe? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now we could pray the rest of it, but he starts talking. <laughs> it's according to that same power, though. Yes, sir. Now this is a part that's still in the oven. <laughs> In the same way, it's not our power that raised us from the dead. Really, we have a corpse can't raise itself. There's no good works. It can, there's not even any prayers it can pray, if you want to be honest. There's nothing a corpse can do. It's totally dependent upon God. What he's showing me, this power that is so great in us. 
great to us. Let me say it that way. This power, this exceeding greatness of his power to us. He's saying, you got to understand that power flows the same way. Jesus said continually, it's the Father in me. He doeth the works. And in John 17, he said, Father, that they all may be one as we are one. I in them and thou in me. We've got Christ in us. And that the Father is in Christ. The portal. I, I, there is a portal. Each believer is a portal. If you'll allow me. Through which the kingdom of God can flow. The power of God can flow. Benny Hinn one time said, I'm just a hose. <laughs> I'm not anything. I'm just a hose. And the power of God flows through me like water does through a hose. It's got nothing to do. It's not the hose. Don't give the hose any glory. It's all God. The power is all His. I'm just the hose. That's, I think that's pretty good. You know. Jesus said, I'm, it's not me. It's the Father in me. Say it with me. It's not me. It's the Father in me. He doeth the works. And He has all power. And it flows through me. Hallelujah. Nathan, I'm going to take your record away. I think I'm finishing quicker than you. So, I don't have anything else. If I was you, I would meditate on this. Pray this. Let, let that image of that. The power that he just freely gave us to raise us from the dead. Is the same power that flows through us to heal the sick. And do all of the things that he wants to do. It is his grace. It is his power. Get over yourself. <laughs> Be the hose. <laughs> let, him, let him flow through you. Amen. Amen.